to get out in the community and help facilitate and moderate discussions like these. And so you've got a lot of AI members out there today. Also a proud resident of Tobin Hill, so really excited about this discussion. Yeah, sorry, I'm pretty quiet, but that's about all I've got to say today. <laughs> so we're only going to be presenting the first hour and then we'll break up, so we'll stand in the middle and help his voices to carry more. Yeah, we can stand in the middle and, and if you're having trouble hearing in the back for the just for this first 45 minutes, maybe you can uh, just pull your chairs up. Well, I'm a former teacher, so I know how to talk loud. Loud me, I'm a former English teacher. <laughs> <laughs> um, chair one is um, uh, I'm on the steering committee and it's a coalition of over 50 downtown neighborhoods as well as 15 uh, partners with 15 organizations and advocates. And we're proud to uh, partner today with the AIA, with the Conservation Society, with the Office of Historic Preservation. You know that our neighborhoods are facing unprecedented change, development, and stress. And we're hoping that, that these tools, and education is power, 
tool, these tools will help you make good decisions with your neighbors about the development that's coming in. You know, everything intersects everything else. So we, we don't address today, you know, issues of sustainability, of affordability, of preservation of vulnerable communities. But that is also part of our discussion. Whether or not we say it, you know, out loud, it is always present and something we're, we're working on. So um, thank you for being here. Thank you all for coming. Um, so first, David's going to talk generally about um, uh, the built form and about urban design and talk about some of the, the concepts we're going to be exploring today. Uh, Anissa's going to follow on with some uh, uh, case studies, you know, San Antonio specific examples of, of some of the challenges and opportunities that we've run across. And then I'll take a few minutes to introduce our table moderators and talk about the sort of fun events that we have planned for the morning. So with that, I'll turn it over to uh, David. So um, I'm going to try to read from my notes for brevity. Uh, so in workshop one, I spoke about how design matters for infill development. I briefly touched on rationales for why infill is important and how goal number one of SA Tomorrow, our comprehensive plan, um, puts maintaining the character and integrity of neighborhoods uh, first. Next slide. Next slide. Thank you. Um, so I asked I ask, uh, the audience, how is the character and integrity of your neighborhood being described and documented, and how is it being measured? And how will we know if it's being maintained if we don't describe, document, and measure it? Um, that's still on my to-do list for my neighborhood. We began to address how to describe the character and integrity of your neighborhood in the last session. Next slide. So, I will be covering some of the same topics as the last workshop. Scale, massing, and setbacks. And Denise is going to follow, talk more about a couple of uh, case studies to, to using these elements to analyze this project case study characters. And she'll explain the density and intensity of our list. Using these concepts to describe our built environment and how we perceive it will help us find ways to design to create compatibility between infill and existing neighborhood contexts. Next slide. So this is about scale, and scale of buildings and spaces contributes to character. Scale is the size of buildings, the size of buildings in relation to other buildings and spaces around them. We talked last week about generic or relational scale, objects to objects, and we talked about human scale, relationship of object size to people. Uh, and I'm going to quote, uh, many building elements have sizes that are familiar to us and can therefore be used to help us gauge the sizes of other elements around them, such as elements, such elements as res residential window units and doorways can give us an idea of how large a building is, how many stories it has. This gable house and even the cat appear small next to the large brick building, especially because of the large windows in the brick building. Neighborhood character and massing. Uh, we talked about how the shapes of buildings uh, constitutes massing, and also the relationship between masses and voids can be considered part of massing. Um, voids includes the street spaces, porches, even the fenestration openings and buildings. Next. So uh, 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 one big part of massing is roofs. And, and just briefly, a couple of the most uh, common pitch roofs here are the, the gable, which is at the top of the side, and uh, the hip roof, which is the lower left side. You can also combine them, and you can have a hip gable, the lower right side, uh, the lower right diagram. And so how these affect, uh, next, uh, how these affect character. So and this is an example of an aplex in Alta Vista. It uses a medium slope hip roof to, to an effect. And, and that's to recede. The roof recedes from side, uh, doesn't 
perceptually at scale to the building mass. Um, and so its character and street presence could be very different if it had tall, tall gables, for example. Next slide. So these, these two one-story homes in Beacon Hill create their street presence more vertically using gables than if, it, if they had hip roofs. Similarly, the effect of the multiple shed roofs high in the background presents a significant portion of the character of that building, at least from, from a half a block away. That's the part that we see. Here. Next. Um, so setback is the third term. And here, uh, we're, we're using a word that describes the distance between the building and the front property line or the side property lines. Uh, but usually when people talk about the setback of the neighborhood, they're talking about the front setback. Um, and really it's about how wide our, our street spaces feel, how wide our, our front edges of our, our yards feel. Next. So, last time we talked a little bit about um, how to become more prescriptive. And this is from a form-based code uh, about the private front end. So this is a way to prescribe the front end of the, of the building. Uh, setbacks can allow different kinds of front edges, front yards or private front edges, as defined here in the form-based code. So last session I mentioned the form-based codes will be able to be more prescriptive. Uh, this private frontage is the layer between the building and the lot line. It's important as it presents the manner in which the pedestrian meets the building facade. So this, this illustrates four different types of frontages. And um, this is an example that caught my eye. My neighborhood. This, uh, this yard is different from, from the other yards on the block. Uh, so how variation occurs from property to property you know, is also an important part of character. This, this, this example of a private frontage, um, modern home in Austin has elements of scale and proportion that relate to the surrounding buildings, and by conforming to the regularity of the building setback, it appears compatible, at least to my eye. And again, a lot of this is culturally based, and certain things may be compatible with others that aren't to you. Uh, so, uh, speaking about compatibility, one, one approach to compatible development is called mis the missing middle housing. And it's, it's residential multifamily building forms that are widely accepted as being compatible in single family or detached development patterns. So, duplexes, triplexes, courtyard apartments, bungalow court, townhouse, multiplexes, and even live work buildings uh, are, are character types of middle, missing middle housing. There's a couple of examples again from my neighborhood. The triplex is the blue one. There are two quadplexes to their right. And then the next diagram, uh, this is their illustration from missingmiddle.com of how missing middle, which are the yellow, uh, yellow yellowish buildings, can blend into a neighborhood of detached, low density, which are the purple buildings. And the next slide is how they are compatible and also can provide a transition between a detached on the left neighborhood and their more commercial or more intense uh, urban area on the right. Thank you. Too much. It's too much. 
But really, it's not always the density that we think is too much. Often it's the intensity. Um, mm. Density is the number of units on a lot, the number of units per acre. So that means um, a fourplex is four units, so a single family home is one unit. Um, and many times when things are proposed, they say, oh, it's going to be 18 units per acre. Mm. Intensity is more about the size, the scale, the massing of the buildings. It's how big the buildings are, how big it looks from the street, um, and more about how many or how big of the buildings are on the lot. So it's actually different. <coughs> um, this slide is, a, is from the city of Portland, and I think it's a really great example that illustrates the difference between intensity and density. All four of the color houses are the same density. They're all one. They're all one single family home. But you can see the house on the left is much, much smaller and much less intense than the house on the right. As it goes, it gets more intense. The house on the far right is three stories, where the one on the left is one story. So that's, that is kind of the difference between intensity and density. So this is the project that happened in my neighborhood. Um, oh, no. <laughs> this uh, was a pair of duplexes across the street from me. Um, and there were actually two lots, and they were four one-bedroom, one-bathroom duplexes. Um, and the first thing that we're going to talk about when we look at this project today is the massing. You can see the massing is what we say we were talking about the general shape and size of the building um, and how we perceive that. So the solids are now pink, and I included the house next door. Um, and boys is everything else, right? The sky, the grass, the, the stuff around the buildings. Um, what has been built in its place is were demolished, and we had a developer come in and build six single family homes that are going to be sold in a condo scheme. Um, and now the massing will show you again in pink. It's different. I tried to get the same perspective. The first one is from the Google card, so I can't get up the side. But um, you can see that there's a lot more mass to the new development than there was before. So here is kind of an aerial view of that lot with um, the builder's site plan superimposed on there. And the thing I want to point out here is the setback. I drew a red line where the setback is on the set of the homes that were established on the <laughs> original homes. The six homes that were built, um, the front two, are much closer to the street than the rest of the homes. The setback is what is the term we use when you're trying to describe how far the building is set back from the public right of way. <coughs> Neighborhoods, that's going to be the sidewalk. If you have the sidewalk, it's always the property line. Um, Where is it? But visually, we Did see it as the sidewalk? street. Yep. This is San Antonio. Sorry. <laughs> exactly. I'm like <laughs> So you can see this development that my neighbors were pretty resistant to um, was was much closer to the street than the existing homes. When we were struggling to negotiate with this developer. Um, I, I met Jim from Alma Architects, and he uh, did a drawing for our neighborhood um, to just sort of show us what might be possible with the same density that this developer was proposing. They wanted six units, they needed six units to make their project work financially. Um, and so Jim came up with a different site plan. This is also six units. Um, it's two duplexes in the front, so that's four, and then there's two smaller ones in the back. Um, I've shown this before at a lot of different events, um, so it might look familiar, but one of the great things about it is he matched the setback of the existing homes. Um, my neighbors are really excited about this building. Uh, it's also one story in the front and two stories in the back, and that matters because the scale of the building surrounding it are also one story. The scale, like like David said, is what we perceive to be, it's, it's the size of the buildings in relation to either people or 
the buildings around it. So this, this concept matched the buildings around it. And you can see, very, very, very small, on the white um, drawing, there's a, there's a little person standing on the porch. So that drawing is demonstrating the scale of those buildings. So it's not just the houses next to it, but you can also see the little person up on the porch. Yes. This is the houses as they're built. You can tell that the scale of the houses that they built is much larger than the scale of the houses surrounding it. These are two-story houses, um, and although there's no person, you can see a porta potty for the <laughs> And we all know what how big a porta potty is, right? um, which is a great illustration of the scale. You can go so um, now I'm going to talk about some development that has happened in the last couple of years in Mickey Park. We're going to look at just one section of Claymont. Um, these houses are in an area that I believe I was told is called Widow's Road. They're duplexes. Um, to the left of the blue house with the same, is a single family home. The blue house is an uptown duplex. The one in the middle is also an uptown duplex. The one to the right is a side-by-side -side duplex. Um, and then on the far right, well, there's a single family home and then there's a multi family um, on the very far right. You can see the top of the two story. These um, three duplexes were demolished, and um, a developer came in and uh, built a different kind of concept of home. So we're going to go to the next slide. Here's an aerial view of those same houses. So I wrote the density in, and it kind of drew in some plot lines. So the density is one for the single family home, two for the duplex, two for the duplex, two for the duplex, and one for the other single family home. So that's a total of eight in this little section. Go ahead. So the developer tore those middle duplexes down and built more single family homes on smaller lots. These are, people call them the skinny houses, they get called cottages. Um, but you can see the existing single family homes on either end. And then one, two, three, four single family homes to the right. And then they did a front and a back single family home on those two larger lots. Um, so the density here increased to eight. You can also see that the massing increased, right? Much more of the lot is being taken up by these houses than before. This is a picture of the skinny houses. So they're all two stories and they're all very close together. And you can see there's not as much void as there is solid now, right? Much more solid than before. So, um, and then the other two, or four, I should say, are that there's um, the two-story house in the front and a two-story house in the back, which you can't really see. It, you can kind of see the one with like the dark, most of colored second story back there. So the massing has really changed on that street. That's where it was before. Maybe you went backwards and you can see that. So here's just a quick last rate of those terms. Um, a lot of times when developers come to our neighborhoods, again, we say things like that feels too big, that looks too dense. I don't think that lot can handle that density. But today we really want to practice using different terms to quantify what we mean. And instead of using this qualitative things like it feels like it looks like it seems like we want to say the density is appropriate but if it was less intense or we want to say it looks like that's out of scale or the scale of that is really great i love how the setback matches the houses on the street so that's sort of the goal today is practicing these terms so we can get on the same page because Developers need to understand what we're saying, and, and we need to understand what they're saying, and the city also needs these quantitative terms. Or did it increase or did it stay the same? 
So the one in Tobin Hill, um, the density increased from four units, which were all one bedroom um, duplexes, so four units, to six uh, single family homes. There are three, four of them are three bedrooms and two of them are two bedrooms. So the density increased there. The density in Mickey Park also increased from eight total to 10 total. Neighborhood and Housing Services Department. She's also a neighborhood liaison. 
And then me, I'll probably jump in and, and work uh, at Anissa's table. My name is Jim Bailey, LMO Architects, may, uh, recently Mayor's Housing Policy Task Force. So these moderators are going to wear multiple hats this morning. The first thing they're going to do is they're going to come to your table as a developer with the first development proposal that your new informed neighborhood design review committee is going to is going to tackle. And they're going to lay out this proposal and they're going to tell you what they think the benefits of this, this, this proposal are. And you're going to consider it. Then, then the moderator is going to put on his, his or her neighborhood advocate hat, uh, roll up their sleeves and sit down, with the table, sit down at the table with you to have a conversation about you know, how, how to express your thoughts about that proposal that's just been presented to you and come up with, as a committee with a response. Here's what we want to see from you, developer. Um, you know, here are the things that are important to us about our neighborhoods, and we're going to use these terms that Anissa and David have talked about, um, you know, uh, density versus intensity, you know, scale, setbacks, uh, massing, and, and we're, going to, we're going to formulate our response as a committee in those terms. And the conversation can be a little more free-ranging than that. So then, you're going to communicate that to the, to the developer. The developer is then going to come back with another scheme that hopefully addresses, and it may or may not, you know, hopefully addresses some of the things that you brought up. And there are two or three, or in some cases, four total options for each site that we've developed. Uh, these, these options obviously can't uh, encompass every possible comment that someone might have, but hopefully it will serve as a good sort of exercise to allow us to just begin to talk about these things and, and form a, a kind of a common vocabulary. So uh, the way it's going to work, hopefully we'll have a good time. Um, we're going to try to limit this to an hour. We're hoping that the first component, the presentation of the initial scheme, your conversation and feedback is in the 20-minute frame. Um, that would allow 10 to 15 minutes for a counter proposal um, and perhaps a, a very short period to look at one or two other options. We then need time at, as, as a committee to sit down and write up the report what kind of what happened. And I think we have, can we raise our hands, table scribes? We have one, two, <coughs> three. Hey, Shepard. Um, we may need to have a couple of more table scribes. Okay, so so we'll have table scribes. So so the group will work together to generate um, a report out, and then each group, the, the, the chair of the neighborhood design review committee, will uh, stand up with the table moderator and get just a quick report out. Um, so with that. Let's get going. We won't have much parking on the street. It'll really be a beautiful environment. Beautiful historic looking homes that respect the setbacks of the neighboring properties. So, yeah, this, this has the appropriate zoning to allow us to have eight units on the property. So we'll have no problem. We won't need a zoning change. What is the appropriate zoning? What, what is the zoning? You're saying it's appropriate, but what is the actual? In this case, it's one large lot, so it would need the multifamily zoning. We only have eight units, and it's on a half an acre. So, so it's zoned MF? It's zoned MF. Two stories about that. It could be possibly offices or other kind of different kinds of housing units. And then a very small five story. Yeah. So the condo tower here, so the whole development together, the very the tallest part, eight stories. And you can see that I've taken the tallest part of the building and set it back. And the setback is right to the side The setback is it matching the other homes? All right, so to fit this number of units for our pro forma. The economics of this land is so expensive. And the development cost of the land. And the development cost of the land is so expensive that we really have to get six units. And prior to the 
possibility of this development? What, how many units were on that corner? Oh, when we bought the, the lot, it was vacant. And how does this impact single family homeowners' property values? This is a prison like entrance. <laughs> Like, I've heard more of a setback and yeah, sidewalk stuff. I've heard concerns about the overall height yeah. and windows looking into the neighborhood. Is there any I didn't that's have any a, room for any green on That's this. a good thing. So you like some green? Yeah, yeah that's yeah, a good so, that would be nice. So, when someone mentioned earlier that there, it was kind of too close to the street edge, maybe right. it could like, be pushed back a little bit okay. and, and to allow for some additional trees. When you push back, who else are you pushing back? The parking lot is property. Yeah. First of all, what if you knock down? Yeah. What are you gonna knock down? This could be a case where you might say, okay, this is better because these type of units are mixed. Okay, I need uh, whatever this is, 32 units. Yeah. The reality is they probably need 24 or 26, but they're gonna ask for 32. So push back and say, can you knock it down one or two? Yeah, okay. So always yeah, okay. Okay, everyone. I know we're having a great time, but we need to move on to the next segment. If I can have your attention, please. Thank you. Okay, so do you have a good time? Okay, great. Uh, so I think the next thing we want to do is we want to walk around to each table um, and have the moderator of the table scribe and the Des neighborhood design review committee chairperson stand up and deliver a brief report. Um, so we have three different sites that we tackled. There were um, two tables tackling each site. So when you stand up, give a brief description of the initial proposal, uh, which uh, at least the first time it, it, it comes up, the initial proposal, and then uh, begin to talk about your process and, and the conclusions that you ultimately arrived at. So let's go ahead and go in table order. In table one, so table one was a uh, single, largely single family detached, mix of one and two story homes, uh, residential neighborhood. And this is a mid block condition. Um, it's probably one of the hardest conditions that we, we find ourselves tackling as, as neighborhoods and designers and, and uh, you know, and, and city review people. So with that, uh, take one. Okay, so this is our initial uh, proposal. It's like Jim said, it's a mid-block proposal. Um, we proposed eight townhouse buildings in the middle of this block that is predominantly single-family homes. All right, so um, we felt like it, the massive was, was just over overstayed. We just felt like the, the setback seemed like it was okay. Not, okay. okay. The yeah. setback seemed like it was okay for the most part, but it was really about the massive. It seemed like it was just too much. It just seemed like it was too dense, and so you know we went back and forth. We talked about the fact that the orientation to to the main street wasn't there. <coughs> you know, it didn't have any kind of uh, acknowledgement of the porches and the scale and everything of the rest of the neighborhood. So we went to option two. So the, the developer listened to us and um, the questions were, well, are these going to be sold or rented? And he said, well, we don't know. She said, she didn't know. Um, we about we, we, I'm sorry, I don't want to interrupt you, but I'm going to interrupt you. Um, <laughs> we also talked about how maybe it doesn't matter if it's a rental or a uh, uh, going to be sold as a homeowner because um, there are great homeowners, there are lousy homeowners, there are great rental renters, there are lousy renters, and our neighborhood decided, this neighborhood decided they didn't want to discriminate against renters or homeowners. So we yeah. decided to that. Yeah, so that, that was the end result as we talked about renting and, and you know, and, and that you know, we need some rental. So we were okay with rentals. Alley was an issue about coming in on the alley. So some of the uh, committee members felt that um, they didn't really like, they didn't believe that alley should be used <coughs> in terms of access that way. Other committee members felt that seemed okay. 
We stayed with the eight units, um, but we also said it felt too tall. So we took a boat, and it, it you know, it sort of passed, but then it didn't end, and we said, well, now it was too tall. And so then we said, no, no, no. And so then we said, we still need to talk about the street. So, so the developer, Charles Alden, their architect. So the architect came in, listened to what we were talking about, and we created these um, sort of single story <coughs> entry going to the two story that's that you. And then in the back, we came two and a half stories. And we felt like the two and a half stories in the back was okay because you know, this was made for dinner, there was the alley, um, and it wasn't too intrusive. We're here one night, right next to these homes, having a one story was much more compatible than they have to look at the house. And it was just sort of a, a, greater, a better entry. And it's better scale, better mousing. Um, sort of the, the, the density state the same, but we, we felt like, like it worked. But then they showed us the last one at, at the end, which we were like, and we all, the majority still held the book we bought. We said, mm, yeah. So this goes down to six units, the density decreased. But the committee, um, people like the scale of these huge, these huge masses in the front looking onto these homes. They felt, and we felt like that was just the, too much of a privacy, sort of a privacy issue. All of a sudden, we were really, you know, uh, lo lose all their privacy. Um, and at this big space in the middle was sort of weird, and then the tiny homes in the back. So we were pretty happy with the eight units. Especially if we're going to rent And then we talked about affordability, and then we could talk to the city about some kind of um, affordability for some of these units. Where, so, are, the, where are the eight units in that? Okay. So it's uh, one, two, three, four, and these are five, six, seven, eight. Okay. It doesn't, it's the part of it you can barely see through here, it's still part of this. Okay. So they pop up to three stories. So we sort of go like we got the eight, we got the density, which you know we're not so against the density as much as scale and massing. And so if the scale and massing worked, you could actually have more density. That was our right. So the intensity from the street decreased, and on the side it was less intense because it, the setbacks were um, further in; they were larger on the side as well. So it just seemed like it was more generous to the game. So, yeah. They ended up with a higher risk. Yeah. 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 So, so a similar scenario, this is what we started out with. We have the same design on table one. Okay. So <coughs> eight. Um, the first thing that the committee spoke to that they wanted to see changed was the orientation of the front two buildings. So they're currently facing the interior drive. We want them to face towards the street. One of the comments the developer made was about um, making sort of this private community. And of course, that is the antithesis of what we try to do. We want assimilation. We want integration. So uh, again, orienting these front two towards the street and also, then, the, sorry, no, go ahead. the scale on this, we have two and a half story buildings facing the street with the tall gable. So we're looking at a 35 foot tall home peak adjacent to single family homes on this street, even though there is a two story on the street. The group, the neighborhood group felt it was out of scale and a little too tall and a little too close to the street to really be in context with the neighborhood. So what we were asking for the developer to do was to align the building mass with the neighboring buildings, which is exactly what, what Alan just presented. Um, the density wasn't an issue. Again, it was the intensity. So it wasn't the number of units, it was the massing and the scale of the units. So the same thing there. We were okay with the setback. We felt it was in line. Not, not any street has exactly a straight line across. So we felt that the setback was appropriate. 
This, yeah. The next one was the apartment court, which grouped buildings together in a different way than the previous scheme, where it was almost eight separate homes on land. This one creates a kind of apartment courtyard with then two and four residences in the back. So this was our least favorite. We didn't feel like this solved the problem at all of the massing and the intensity. It, it didn't even really orient the buildings towards the street. It just provided this sort of interior court. So we didn't spend a lot of time on this one because it, <coughs> we would have preferred the first one over this one. So we kind of uh, skipped over that because we, just, we felt like this made it look more like multifamily and it didn't address the orientation and so forth. It was and the, totally out of character. Yeah, the example is a similar building that is in Monte Vista and it's on a street corner on San Pedro and Woodlawn, I think. McCullough. We just, McCullough, right. McCullough and Weasach, one of those. So like uh, their much development, we're dealing with a mid-block, which does make a difference as versus when you're on a corner. So they ran me, the developer, out of town on this one. <laughs> 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 and then the third uh, example, which again is similar to your third example, but we came up with a different result in the sense that our group preferred this one and the spacing, viewing <coughs> these as almost consistent with the carriage house. Uh, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, arrangement on our in our historic neighborhoods, and the fact that by having the larger open space in the middle, it aligned better with what were backyards uh, on the neighboring lots, and so it actually we felt that it actually was more consistent with what was on either side, and that it provided, you know, maybe options for more affordable housing by having these uh, carriage style homes in the back. It, it corrected for the orientation, providing for the pay porches to the front. It kept the uh, e ingress, egress off the main street where the other one would have, all the middle one, the second one would have been all from the alley. And we did talk a lot about whether the orientation of these, the back half of the home, because these are each two, so two and two with a, a front that was a one story and a back that was the two and a half. We talked about should we orient that towards the front and um, the guidance we had from our, our uh, architect was that that can actually increase the the mass the, or the perception of mass whereas having this roof actually um, wouldn't cause that increase and so uh, we preferred we decided to stick with this we obviously would have preferred to see just two stories instead of two and a half uh, but our main concern was the orientation to the street the space in the middle which provided more open space more aligned with the neighboring prop, uh, properties and having these two units in the back which might provide for more some affordable housing and what what's i feel sold the group as me pretending to be the developer was the concessions made from the previous schemes we went from eight units in those down to six in this we created more open yard space i tried to explain it in a way that by putting the homes up front as one larger mass it relates to the neighboring homes and preserves open space of yards so one could argue that these taller homes are looking into the home next door but really they're not they're going to look at the roof next door <laughs> versus it being here you really will sense that loss of privacy by the home looking into your backyard where you may have a pool or a playground set or something um, so there were concessions made that not all developers may make with you as neighbors uh, going down to six units is a loss of profitability but overall it felt our group felt that this really fit the context and the scale of the neighborhood better 
And just as an aside, what I think is interesting <laughs> and for us all to keep in mind is, and it was Alan's uh, comment, he, the developer may have all these three drawings provided by the architect. He's not bringing all three. He's only bringing the one with the eight. So it's the pushback of the neighborhood that, that all of a sudden said, oh, what about this option? And clearly this performa is also going to work for them or they're not going to even introduce it. So that's something for us to keep in our minds when we're reviewing. Let me pause you right there. I think that that's something that um, a couple of people have said to me today. We, we need to understand that in many cases, a developer doesn't need to talk to the neighborhood, right? They may have their zoning in place already. We have very few historic districts. The vast majority of neighborhoods inside Fort Penn and San Antonio, all 150 of them or whatever, have no protections whatsoever. There are a couple of NCDs. But generally, if you've got your zoning in place, there's no reason for the developer to come talk to you. So, um, and, and the idea that the carrot works better than the stick. If the developer is there because the council person said go talk to the neighborhood, use that as an opportunity, right? If, and we, and we, I heard a couple of people right at the start, well, this is just horrible and there's no way we're gonna support this or whatever. If, if you have that attitude right when the developer walks in, the developer just will, will dig their heels in or leave the meeting and they're like, okay, well, fine, I'll just go call my lawyers and you can talk to the lawyers. So I, I think that, Cosima's point was really good. Like what's happened here is, as, as you guys have probably seen in negotiations with developers who do want to play ball, is that if you, if you make a good faith effort to work with them, you will see that second scheme. And you may even see that third scheme. But if you just, if you just get your hackles up and say, you know, no developers are evil, we want you out of our city, probably all you'll ever see is that first scheme. <coughs> Thank you. So our side is a, is a corner, corner neighborhood side. And this is what the, the developer came to present it to us. There were some, some, uh, there were some terms of, uh, terms of art that were used to describe this uh, by our neighborhood that, that, uh, we're not going to repeat. Are we talking about no, no terms of art like like the setback is inappropriate because it's zero in a neighborhood where there's setbacks of 20 feet and the scale and the massing are, are out of scale with it because it's four stories and combined with the small setback creates a very different experience from the street than is exists in our neighborhood. And one of our committee members uh, was noting immediately that it did look like a wall, like a wall on Willow Street uh, that a pedestrian would walk by and would feel like it's falling on top of them. And it's, that's six units. So we, we talked about the setback, that we, didn't, we were not in agreement with the setback, we were not in agreement with the intensity of the buildings, the height of the buildings, uh, the massing. And, and so he came back with these. And uh, these are five units, they're townhomes. Uh, he, he adjusted, the developer adjusted the, the setback. It's, uh, and one of the committee members had asked, you know, is it possible on the site, that wall site, that you put porches and have it more open? Uh, it's three stories uh, <coughs> and uh, five units. Uh, the parking is in the back, so there's garages on the back. We were talking about, uh, well, what about these? our neighbors here? Would they want to look into these garages? And, and the developers said, well, you know, we could do some kind of landscaping there. Um, and so we were, we liked uh, the, the design and, and, and the fact that it's on a corner street. The density, like many of the groups, the density wasn't the, the issue. It was the intensity and the massing. Um, and the, the setbacks being too close to the street. Uh, he showed us some other designs as well that were went down in density, but didn't smaller homes, but didn't quite fit. You know, they were smaller, but they were they looked out of out of scale to um, to the other houses. <coughs> and they were three three units. This was four. Four units. Uh, 
and then we looked at one that had three units. Uh, the developer also said, you know what, I made a mistake. There is a, it's not a vacant lot completely. It's zoned for multifamily. The, the lot was zoned for multifamilies, but there, I made a mistake. There's a, a, a house on this corner over here. So will you let me demolish it? And we said, no, you, you know, this is a historic neighborhood. No, we're not going to let you demolish it. So he came up with he came up with this design where uh, they would remodel the old house and then build these townhomes, but I, they went down to three units, right? So. Um, and we're all at our table, we're all saying, no developer would do this for me. <laughs> 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 that, they would just say, forget it, we're demolishing the house. We don't care to say, uh, we're going to build six units. But, um, you know, it was a, a, a nice exercise for us to see, you know, would, would we in a historic neighborhood defend the demolition of an old home? And, and one of the things that all of us were in consensus of no, it, you know, we would not allow that house to be demolished. It's in a historic neighborhood. It, it should be part of the history of that neighborhood. And so he, the developer said, yeah, well, we can save it, we'll renovate it, and make three units. But we were very happy with this one. We felt it was appropriate since it was a corner. We felt that the massing and intensity of the building were way better aligned to what was already there in the neighborhood with these houses. Um, we were happy that they included a lot of the elements that we were concerned about with the setbacks, the porch, the design of the windows. One of our, our committee members said, you know, we maybe consider the design of windows so that they're more in scale to the windows that are in the other houses. And also the, the fact that uh, the developer was adding trees, we said, are those, would you add those trees or would the owners have to put them? He says, no, we can add them and uh, we'll put the landscaping in the back. And, and, uh, and we appreciate the fact that, that it, it went down to five units uh, instead of six. Um, and we did talk about affordability. Um, you know, we asked, well, how much would something like this go for? You know, um, and he told us about three hundred and fifty thousand, somewhere around there. Um, higher. And, and higher. <laughs> higher. 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 So we were, we were concerned about that um, because many in our committee are, are advocates for affordable housing, and so um, so these were things that we were, were discussing in our group as well. So it had a, a two-story, a predominant roof line and two stories, and the, the third one was above that. So it's kind of a two and a half story, kind of a three hybrid. Um, but they felt that was that was a bit a big thing, and, and the idea of it being a multiplex or an apartment building was okay again on the corner, and it was actually preferred over over the. Uh, over the almost faux appearance of smaller homes very, very close to each other, which is not characteristic of this neighborhood. The characteristic of the neighborhood is, is detached homes with significant space between them. So when, it, when they became like this, it, it, it was a different animal, so to speak, that, that they prefer the multiplex. Thank you. We have a very similar situation to the previous presenters. Um, this was a big no, okay, in, in terms of the, uh, it, there was just, it was like a selfie, so you no, know, doesn't work for the neighborhood for so many reasons, and, and a lot of them mechanical, you know, when you're trying to get into those garages, that turning radius is no good, so all of a sudden you have cars on the street parking, Willow is narrow, what does that do about safety? And accessibility in terms of traffic. Um, it, it, we had a lot of suggestions for how that could be made better. The height was overwhelming to the surrounding. So this was our big no. So you can go away. <laughs> now the developer came back and 
said, ah, and interestingly, because like I said, our table dove deep, and I have to tell you that the we had consensus at the table, but it, it, we also had, um, no, not in our historic neighborhood. This isn't historic. And so we had that voice too. And what we were talking about, what Jim was talking about, in terms of gaining consensus and being reasonable and working with people, we're gonna get more flies with honey. If we beat them with that stick, they're, they're just gonna crush us. So how, how, this is a very effective practice that we've done today. I love what we did. So, our suggestion, because again, we're looking at two and a half to three stories, question was, what's our overall height? Wonderful little gadget we have here, drive through the neighborhood really quick. Don't assume that whatever they're gonna give you is accurate to scale. So, looking at this, this is my neighborhood. I know exactly what that house is. Uh -huh. This actually plays a school leaf, but it's an alley. Now, what we're dealing with is an existing structure right here. Now they want to place this new construction place in Willow. One of our issues is the fact that we have to make sure it's consistent with the sidewalks. They want to bring it in. We like this. We have compromises here, but they also met us halfway because they're giving a nice entrance into this development. Now, with this existing structure, we also are concerned about accessibility, making sure that there's a drive-through access. Why do you just have to have access through Carson and not turn around onto Willow for safety issues? So looking at this, we're looking at the scale, and we're finding out through the map that the only structure in front in this perimeter of this project is one house that's a two-story development. We don't want this one to over extend itself and be the most prominent structure in this portion of the neighborhood. We want to leave the aesthetics of an existing structure be the, the most focal point for that part of the neighborhood if this is going to be new development. All of you know about rezoning. You go to HDRC and rezoning. They give you a 200 foot radius for the proposed new zoning. That should also apply for the height and density for this development. We have to respect 200 feet. They should respect, respect the, height, the height the and height. intensity. So because we weren't so concerned about density yeah. like you guys. It was about the intensity of the structure. Exactly. exactly. So looking at this structure here, we can see that there is a rounded porch. The design was fine, but let's go ahead and move to the details. Let's copy and, re and replicate just our own little detail of a rounded porch in this corner. It'll mimic, it'll mirror itself because this is going to be an entire area of Willow Street that's going to be facing and complementing this existing structure. You all know that the existing structure is actually the antique one, the historical, but the new structure is going to marry itself with it. So we want to compromise. We, talk, we talked about metal roofing. We talked about maybe maybe taking the pitch up a bit. Uh, we talked about overhang and how it, it, not always about rain, but about sun and, and the longevity of the buildings. Um, we talked about these trees, although we thought they're nice. Someone at our table brought up, oh my God, that condo association is gonna be having a headache with roof issues in about 20 years. So, so how do we incorporate green areas it's not always about the trees maybe they're you know finding where the appropriate placement of the tree is but in very narrow yards it's not always the best solution so so allowing for green asking for green um and making those kinds of compromises now living in a historical neighborhood we're also having to deal with what's happening with downtown government hill is adjacent to the area of the pearl we have all of these scooters coming through our neighborhood. We have a lot of walkability. We have a lot of bicycles. New development should also consider mobility. As homeowners, we're responsible for our sidewalks, which means the new developer is responsible for his new sidewalks. So make sure when they're developing, they add that infrastructure around the perimeter of their new construction with proper sidewalks, newer sidewalks, and even an area for them to park those scooters. 
because most likely these are going to be tenants and homeowners who are going to be using those to access downtown living or the neighborhood. So instead of having them scattered all along the front, how about dock in an area located with the new construction code? Because we also okay. we also question you know, along with you know 21st century new buildings, thinking about where we're at. Where are we putting our garbage? You know, what will be the solution for this? Will there be a dumpster? Will there be, you know, everyone, the 15 cans for three houses? That's what we're looking at these days. So how does, again, this is a little detail that an amenity that you asked for, because as Jim pointed out, these aren't cheap. Mm -hmm. And they've already made a compromise coming from six down to five. They're probably, again, not going to make that further compromise. So what, what are the little amenities that aren't expensive but that are thought about and addressed? And I think that is true of everything going into our older neighborhoods. Our, it, it's like thoughtfulness, not just leaving the neighborhood to deal with the uh, the. The, the backlash and the consequences and the developer is long gone. And so with the compromise, we decided that we looked at this development right here and it had a lot of similarities that we see at Fort Sam. This is called Government Hill because it was part of Fort Sam and the housing for the military services. So this had that kind of that same feel of what you see on Fort Sam if you have a luxury of going in there. And you can see some of the there to some of the housing. So it's complementary to the area around you. You're not going to have this inside of a modern, modern neighborhood in the Stone Oak area because it's not going to fit inside of the neighborhood. Or in the Jefferson area, it's going to have different details to it. It might have the same footprint, but details mean everything. Same thing with the mailboxes. We know right now they're having an issue with mailboxes being broken into. Are they going to be individual mailboxes? Or are we going to have a special compartment outside in the front? Those are little details that not only will be important for the new owners and tenants, but for the neighborhood itself. Because we're going to grow, we're going to develop. But let's think about the details that we don't have to come back and say, why didn't we think about that before? Yeah. Or why didn't we come up with a solution before it was being built? So let's help the developer, help the architect and engineer, and come up with the ideas that we're dealing with right now. Because I walk out of my house and I've got a scooter in front of in, in my driveway. And I have to go out and pick it up so I can get out of my house. So let's make sure we have all of these nice compromises. But you know, we're working together, and as you said, we have all these different designs. So if you have an opportunity to have an opportunity to speak to the designers, the developers, I think that's the best way we can. Yeah, we can't be the voice of the no. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we even though they were, were less dense approaches, it, it, it just for us didn't fit in. We barely spoke about them, but I wanted to address that we did look at them. The winner for us was number two. Yes. I love the, the thing that you identified that the two-story house in the neighborhood was right across the street. Yeah. So how did you end up justifying this solution being taller than that? It's, no, we it's wanted not. to bring it down. We wanted to bring it down. We wanted to bring it down. The street is a Victorian and it has some higher pitches. This yeah. one has lower okay. pitches, but it's two and a half, so I think. So and it's also the elevation because it's called Government Hill because we do have a hilly yeah. part. So we're going to have to look at the elevation when we work with the designers and the architects to see where it sits. In that, that particular case, since I, I drew it, I can tell you that that Pitch on that solution number two is exactly the same. Yeah. The ridge is at the same height. Yeah. And, and that <laughs> but it is greater intensity. It has yeah. more mass because right. that Victorian has a, a steeper brick. Right. So use your equipment. I mean, the point of view, if you're having meetings, get on there, yeah. look at the, the diagram, go on Beacon, you can see a map, take a satellite route, and you can see what's around there really, really easy before you say it and approve anything. Just say, you know what, I'm looking at it right now. Is this what you're thinking about? So you have to be an advocate for yourself too, and it's really easy. This is uh, in Monte Vista along San Pedro. San Pedro is designated as a transportation corridor in all the new transportation plans. So this is a uh, much denser plan, and we've looked at it a much more intense plan than we looked at on the other side. Mm -hmm. And we were our response to this one was that it seemed really close to the street. The the height of the building was pretty intense. Um, but there was a conversation about parking and 
the developer's response to that was to put parking kind of protected and hidden, so it wasn't a bunch of cars. You were hiding the retail car, the cars from the retail on the or the mixed development on the first floor within the structure. Um, and our group responded really well to that. There was a conversation about acknowledgement of the heights from the setback of the building, um, but there were concerns about uh, parking. We kind of differed in opinion about parking along San Pedro Creek, so we we never really. Uh, we never really came to a uh, consensus there. It was really about protecting pedestrians and how what are the what are the ways in which we can protect protect pedestrians. And our developer commented that actually cars are a good protection. Um, but we did come back and had conversations about sustainability and not just sustainability as it relates to pedestrians and supporting public transportation, but also. Um, as it relates to material use, because often developments that are coming up, there is, while they are able to pass building codes, they aren't necessarily taking that a step further in terms of how buildings are going to age. Um, what else? This one. Um, we did talk about affordability. What are you know? It, it, we can't really legally. We don't have that power to ask those questions, but. Um, I personally think it's still important to ask those questions when a developer says, we don't need to consider that. Well, my response has been, well, have you thought about whether or not you should as a human, and not just because you're told in the code. Um, I think it's also worth pointing out that on, 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 on the issue of affordability, because I heard it come up at every table, you know, we just put into place uh, a housing policy framework this last summer that, that I worked on. Uh, and over the course of the next uh, 10 years or so, there's about a billion dollar affordable housing plan. And you know, we're gonna have more and more money theoretically available every year. And so I think it's incumbent upon all of us as, as neighborhood members to understand sort of the incentives that are available out there for affordable housing. Because many of the developers that are coming in may be saying, well, I just don't want to deal with the hassle of the bureaucracy, or may not be familiar with with some of these tools and incentives that are out there. And, and if you can say, look, these are these are here and we will support your development if you'll go do X, then they go, hey, well maybe it's worth the headache out Yeah. But it's also in the report to address compassion, right? That was the first report I had seen that included that word. And so it's part to have a city document that uses that word um, and being able to reference it. It's about empathy. You see empathy within a developer's heart. Um, yeah, so this is our. Do you want to? No, it's good. This is the second option. So, th this option uh, takes the intensity of the buildings down, uh, really tries to match it up with one of the existing buildings that's in the neighborhood. It takes the sort of mixed use character down one notch in terms of doing just a one story commercial functioning building. That matches up with the neighboring building, and then units about that, so it takes the sort of office function, potential office function, out of the mix. Mm -hmm. um, so the the group liked the lower height, but did not like how far back that height extended into the neighborhood, um, and the fact that parking went all the way, well, went around the property, uh, was problematic to see all of that parking. Our our group did not like that. Um, I didn't mention this in the last uh, in the last scheme, but the direction of the parking on Lisach and San Pedro it uh, was drawing people into the neighborhood to come back out to park, and so there was we wanted to see an additional plan that it, that more carefully thought through the way traffic was going to move in to park along this street, and so that that was the request. Um, on that because what you were having to do is drive through the neighborhood to park in and just really thinking through the context and that circulation, that choreography of cars. Um, what, what about the setbacks on this scheme? They look like zero. Yeah, we on all of the schemes we wanted it pushed back more, um, not only for pedestrians but also for a designated scooter parking area. Um, <laughs> and developer agreed to that. Um, but also landscaping. We had questions about the material of the, of the sidewalk. 
um, and what that permeability is. And I think that's an important question that needs to be asked as it relates to drainage. Drainage. Yes. Right. Yeah. Not helping you at all. And then this was the third option. So the third option looks at taking the intensity down even further and doing you know, something that's much lower filling in the front three stories, and then taking the back property line and winding up the townhouses. And again, your lower townhouses, three stories, self park, all that. We started talking about affordability of, of this scheme and with the reduced units and the higher quality or the more square footage, um, the chances of it being affordable were being lowered and we did not want to compromise that. And a part of that conversation, um, it came up, the proximity to uh, infrastructure and utilities when you develop high density in the downtown area there is an incentive for the city to do that, but it's an incentive for us too because of the way our tax dollars are spent. And so the more units we put in an area that has access to police, firefighters, water, gas, all of that, I don't have to tell this room that, um, the, better, the better it is for us as a city, right? You're not extending lines. So we did not like this as it related to the density, uh, and this was the least, this is the least favorite of the options, even though the height seemed more reasonable. So, and, and part of that was it was a fit of the table that sort of townhouses lining the back side of the site wasn't a good solution, really, for the neighborhood. Partly because of sort of pushing well, little higher buildings a little closer <coughs> to the neighborhood. And uh, she was just saying, <coughs> The parking, the way access to the site was, was working, but it just did not seem to happen. Yes, so what was the density of households of this design versus design number two? So we actually didn't have density numbers on these. Okay. So we want to make stuff up. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> it was significantly. But it would be less. Yeah. Um, so we decided as a committee, the consensus was that we wanted to actually go with option one, but ask for a revision of it. Um, and a part of the conversation was we want to make sure that we understand what the timeline is and when we were going to meet with them next. So when are you going to be able to propose a revised option 1A with the request of setback, the, the pedestrian circulation, vehicular circulation, the added green space, specificity on the, mater on the material of the surface um, as it relates to drainage? Okay. <laughs> And, and, and one thing that was, we were really, we thought this height was really aggressive, but we really talked about San Pedro Creek. And so understanding. Street. Street, right? Avenue. Avenue. San Pedro Avenue. Um, understanding what, what other developments of this height are along that street. And so in the next presentation that the developer gives, give more contextual information as it relates to developments of this nature, and then asking developers um, what other projects they've done that are similar to this and the context of those. We also want to get the opinion, um, make sure that the developer is talking to the adjacent neighbors, not just everyone who showed up at the meeting. Right. So that's that was another thing. Um, what else? Oh, sustainability, asking what your target strategies are using that language and saying, what are, what, what are the strategies, but what is your target um, from an environmental standpoint? Uh, one, one thing uh, we talked about was uh, whether or not asking, uh, whether or not they have uh, checked with VIA uh, and COSA about the, about the easements, right the street easements, the right of way easements. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you guys didn't hear, talking to the city and asking what their plans are for easements and right of ways, when you're talking about introducing parallel parking or landscaping, and then also making sure that you have conversations with VIA about the public transportation that has access, especially um, if you're doing mixed use, you're going to need that. Excellent. 
This is his rest where he says, my neighborhood is not for sale. So just so you know, you know, what's happening uh, as far as that's concerned. Um, but uh, we when we saw this, we said automatic consent that uh, it was too intense, right? Uh, high. Uh, there's the scale is um, I mean there's the, there's not even any scale. Setbacks, um, what else? We the that was we to be high, so we do it And also we were fighting uh, because of the houses back here, it's be, uh, because of the intensity. So we were concerned that this is on a street, these are commercial, but actually there's no perspective from the single family homes, and that is our major interest in this. And we also said, why not more balconies? It was just like two balconies. Um, parking space, also concerned, I think. Oh, and then somebody said a parking rear too close to the intersection. As people are putting them. We said, okay, so there was less intensity. Okay, it was lower. Yeah. And then, um, then the parking space was, uh, I guess there's parking back here, right? Mm -hmm. That there's parking back here. Um, there's still a boxy look about this this whole uh, building. building. So we wanted more of uh, uh, some kind of architect, some kind of design, uh, some kind of design at the top. Which is what did you say? Yeah. So the developer had actually decided to look at buildings in the neighborhood rather than downtown, and came up with this one a block away. And the group liked how it had. Uh, some design at the top, so it, it, it changed the effect of the boxy massing you see in this render. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things we were also concerned about is some, some green space, and we wanted the setback to be more in line with the other buildings, but we also wanted some green, you know, that, that to provide some shade, to provide, you know. Should I do the over? Mm -hmm. And affordability was an issue for us as well. And so the developer told us that 20% would be at 50%, 50 to 60% AMI. I think now we have some greenery. There's some setbacks that got worked on. There's some design here at the top and it seems to be okay. But I think, that, oh, the parking, the parking got um, moved to the back. Yeah, and then, oh, it was moved to the back, so then the parking got taken away and put more greenery. We wanted a community garden on the roof, and the developer oh, said, sure. Why not? That's, that's okay. a sort of, sorry. So, what we were saying is that we got some greenery, we got a garden in the top because we said we were going to, and he said, yes. Uh, it was pushed back, setbacks. So we really got what we wanted, and he, they were very, very cooperative. <laughs> this is working well. Okay, and this one became the affordability problem was yeah. now we're bringing townhouses. Yeah, I wish it's like table five. The affordability came into question with this one, even though it was lovely. And it's really uh, great to look at. There was density, right? It was, like, a, it was less units, but they wanted like, these are homes, townhomes you can buy for like 300 a million. 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 Yeah. million. So, so then there's storefront, right? There was yeah. just, this is storefront parking. So residents, yeah, residents, all of a sudden that parking went away. I don't know what happened. Maybe on top of the roof, but no. Uh, <laughs> so then we mentioned the law and the townhouses and he said, well, I need to make more money or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. said, That's what he said. That's what he really said. But so that said, kind of begs the question, and it's happened in Beacon Hill, I know it's happened in other neighborhoods, where, well, A, unless you need a zoning change, it's only in a fairy tale or in Star Wars they'd ever be talking to a neighborhood. But B, <laughs> even when they need a zoning change, we've had it happen where we've negotiated all these details, they get to zoning, we present it to zoning, zoning says, okay, you know, everyone's in agreement, and then they don't do it. Because there's no legal imperative for them to do it. Either they'll say, well, you know, things have changed, we can't afford it, we redid the numbers or whatever it is they say. That doesn't happen very often, but it has happened. And so there are legal things that you can do. Customer, they 
deed restrictions. What have we done in Beacon Hill? So deed restrictions. Unfortunately, if you're in a neighborhood like Beacon Hill, there's not a lot of money. We don't charge dues. So I don't know how we find an attorney to enforce that, but it is something that you can do to make sure that what you've agreed upon is something they have to follow through on. And Please also, they, they, they pay attention about the balconies, so they watch for the hidden things. They built all these balconies on the townhouse, so, um, yeah. The only other thing uh, that was mentioned in our design that I wanted to add was, um, the group was very careful to look at the neighboring commercial building and say, you know, it has more of a setback from the street than what you're proposing. So they really use that as a guide to say that's why there should be more of a setback on the Santa Fe Thank you. Uh, again, as we said earlier, we are going to have the third workshop uh, toward the end of March, and uh, we'll move on to the next step. Thank you, Dr.